everybody, my name's Heather. We're so glad that you joined us for Church Online today. In a second, some of our worship team is gonna join us from their living rooms to lead us in worship. I hope you can join in. But before that, we're gonna read Psalm 116 together. Would you join me in reading? Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my cry. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called in the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious is the sight of the Lord in the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. And on the third at break of dawn the Son of Heaven rose again O oh, trampled death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the King O oh, praise the of the Lord our God, who oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh, Lord, O oh, Lord our God. He shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus
Thank you so much for singing with us. I would love to read a prayer out of the Book of Common Prayer over us. God, who has filled the world with beauty, open our eyes to behold your gracious hand in all your works that rejoice in your whole creation. We may learn to serve you with gladness for the sake of him through whom all things were made, Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. Hey, everybody. Hopefully you're doing great wherever you are today. Thanks again for hitting play and joining us for our online gatherings. I know that people hate this term, new normal, but this is kind of the new rhythm for us every week as we join in online together during this pandemic. So thanks for hitting play. If you're a part of our community at Praxis, or maybe somehow you don't even know how you got here. Maybe somebody sent you a link to invite you to join in or you've just come along this. Thanks for listening and joining in. My name is Drew. Uh, I'm the pastor at Praxis Church. Praxis is a beautiful community of people that practice the way of Jesus together. And normally we're together in the same room, but obviously with all that's going on, we've kind of been pushed to these means for now. So thanks for joining in with us. It is the third week of Easter. And some people, when I say this, they're like, what? I thought Easter was a day. I thought it was Resurrection Sunday. Well, technically in the church calendar, which is what we're following as a church community all the way up to Pentecost Sunday in a few weeks, in the church calendar, Easter tide, the season of Easter, is actually six weeks long. And so this is the third Sunday of Easter, and we're following the church calendar right now. And so we're in this series called Tide, just reflecting on these stories of God's love and how Jesus really shows up to people and shows himself to skeptics and doubters and people who have walked away after his resurrection. And we're going to look at a beautiful story this morning, but again, we just wanted to say thanks for being with us. We also wanted to take a moment and say thank you if you're a podcast listener. We have a nucleus of people that listen to our weekly podcast podcasts and our teachings from week to week. And we just wanted to say thank you to you guys for listening in on a regular basis. We love ya. With that said, why don't you open your Bible if you have one and join me in opening it to Luke 24, Luke chapter 24. Now I'll say this before we jump in. If you don't have a Bible, we live in a day where the Bible is more accessible than it's ever been. And so maybe you've hit play on this and you're joining us and you're brand new. You can actually, the words are going to be on the screen, but you can actually follow along on a Bible if you want. It's been made accessible online in a number of different ways. You can go to Bible.com. There's a ton of translations there. And many of us in our community use the YouVersion app. It's for a mobile phone, cell phones, and any device really that you can use to read the scriptures together. It's called YouVersion, and it's been really, really helpful for many of us if you want to join in with us. Luke 24 is where we're going to be. Now, I have a friend. His name is Peter, and Peter is an amazing guy. He is Dutch-Canadian guy. He's in his 50s now. I think he's in his 50s. Tall, handsome, good-looking, and just a blast to be around. And I often joke with my wife, Heather, that when I'm in my 50s, I want to be like my friend Peter. Um, for years, Peter has been a global worker and missionary around the world in a couple different countries. And for, I think, just over 20 years, Peter was a global worker and missionary in Bangkok, Thailand. And I had the pr privilege of visiting Peter twice and just going to Bangkok and the surrounding area and seeing his work, seeing what he does among the people and his ministry there. And it was honestly, those two trips were some of the best trips of my life, just exploring, exploring and seeing what God is doing through Peter and his ministry there. And uh, Peter's kind of legendary in Bangkok. Um, he wouldn't necessarily say this. This is actually from people on the field. They rave about Peter and his leadership and his ministry. But one of the things that a lot of people on the, in the field and on the ground in Bangkok say about Peter is Peter, as a Canadian, came over and learned the language so well. Um, if you don't know, the Thai language can be quite complex. 
and it can be difficult to learn. A number of people go over and try and learn it. It takes years to form the kind of dialect in that language. But Peter went over and worked hard and picked it up right away. And like the legend of Peter is that he hardly has an accent when he speaks in Thai, which is amazing. And so I saw this firsthand on the ground there when I was with him. Now it's interesting, Peter would tell me stories because he became so fluent in Thai and because he's a Dutch Canadian guy, he would go into convenience stores or shops and he would be shopping and browsing within the stores and he would hear the clerk and other people talking about him in Thai. They kind of looked at him and saw him and were like, this guy's probably a tourist. He's not from around here. He doesn't kind of look the part. And so they would kind of talk and joke about him uh, from a distance in Thai. And so Peter often said he would keep shopping and browsing. He'd go and he'd check out, he'd buy his stuff. And on the way out of the convenience store or the store, he'd turn to the clerk and he'd start speaking to them in full Thai, to the clerks, he'd start speaking to them in full Thai, like without an accent. And they would hear in their own language this tall guy from Canada speaking to them and they would be like, oh my goodness, because they knew they had been talking kind of behind his back. And so they'd be so apologetic and I'm so sorry. And Peter would just laugh and smile, speak to them in Thai, have a conversation, and then his day would be on. And as Peter told me this, this particular story of Peter's is a great connection point to the story that we're going to read today. I don't know if you've ever been in a conversation or a group of people and you're talking about someone and you don't realize, maybe it's at a wedding or a social setting, and you don't realize that they're actually a part of the conversation. Has this ever happened to you? Or maybe you're, maybe you're on the, you've been on the other side where... Someone is talking about you, maybe you're at a wedding or again, a social setting, a party or something, and they don't know who you are and they're talking about you as though they know you and you're kind of in the conversation. This is what today's story and text is kind of like. We've been looking at these stories of Jesus showing up to people and we're gonna look at a particular story here where he shows up to people, uh, some of his own disciples. They do not even recognize him and he shows up and he's gonna radically change how they're feeling, their disappointments, their, what they feel now are like their empty dreams. Jesus is gonna to totally reshape and reorient them back towards himself. It's a pretty cool story. So Luke 24, now I'll just preface with this. This is church, this is a church gathering, but this is a long text. I'm gonna read it in its entirety, but I think of any place we could actually read the Bible in long chunks, it's probably, church, right? I know we're not all together in the same room, but I think this is probably a space, but I just wanted to forewarn you that it is a little bit of a long text, but let me read it. Here we go. Luke 24 verse 13 says this. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and then they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus explained to them what he had said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over, so we went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, giving thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. 
their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Now this is a pretty phenomenal story. And one thing we need to kind of wrap our minds around and understand is that these two leaving the city of Jerusalem and heading out of town, completely disappointed because they think Jesus has not risen from the dead. Their dreams are shattered and they're headed towards Emmaus. We need to understand that these are actually legit disciples of Jesus who would have been in community with him. Sometimes we forget because we hear the 12 disciples, we think that Jesus just had 12. But that's actually not true. Jesus had a lot, a lot more disciples than just the 12. The 12 was really a sign and symbol of the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament. It was a picture to show that Jesus was fulfilling Israel's story. He was the Messiah. But Jesus had a number of people that were close to him, including this couple that was leaving town. Actually, in the text, it said they, these people say that our woman come, came to us with this news that the tomb was empty. Um, it's probably the best translation of that from Greek to English is our woman instead of the woman. And it just shows the camaraderie amongst this community of people that were following Jesus together. It went beyond the 12 and it was a community of disciples that were following their rabbi Jesus in everything. And so you begin to feel it. They're disappointed. There are things going on where, they're, again, their dreams of following this king and seeing his kingdom established are shattered through his death on a Roman cross. So the story goes like this. I know we just read it, but it goes like this. Jesus comes up to them on the road as they're leaving town, and he says, so, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, dude, where, like, where have you been? It's Passover. The whole Jewish community, many of the Jewish community are, have descended on Jerusalem for Passover. And they say to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? Like, dude, don't you know over the last couple days that this one has been crucified? And Jesus says to them, what things, right? What? Just playing with them, kind of tongue in cheek. And so what they do is in return, they retell the story to Jesus. They say about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, and, and please just kind of case this, put it in the back of your mind for a minute. They say he was powerful, this prophet, in word and deed, before God and all the people. Then they begin to tell the story of how Jesus went from the chief priest, between the chief priests, and then they were handed over to the Roman Empire and the people that were in charge, and he was sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And then listen to the longing in their hearts. Listen to what they had expected or anticipated. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. This is their, taking their heart and putting it out there. Listen, we thought this guy, we gave everything to follow him. We thought this was the one that was going to be, this, this guy was going to be the one that was going to redeem Israel. Now, it's interesting because in their story, there was so much hope. And it has a lot of its roots in the story of the Old Testament and in the story of the Hebrew people. Even for Jesus to be called mighty and word and deed would have opened up the people's imagination to who this was. You know, since Moses in the Old Testament, who had a prophetic claim that someone was going to come that was mightier than he would, that he was, and somebody was going to come and rise and lead the children of Israel, Israel was longing for this Messiah to come. They got glimpses, glimpses of it through this guy named King David. Uh, he led through something called Israel's Golden Age. There was hopes that had increased that they would as a people, the Hebrew people as a people would receive back their land and their temple and their king. One of the things that Israel was living in is they were living in exile. So they had lost their land, their temple, their king. They were living under empires and they were being tossed to and fro uh, by the rising tide of the nations and empires that were over them. And so 
people would come along, different figures from Moses to David and so on, and kind of spark the hopes of the people that this may be the Messiah. This may be the one that actually comes to save us. And so Jesus comes, and now in their disappointment, these two particular disciples are heading to Emmaus, basically replaying everything that, everything that they saw in their heart, in their mind, in their imagination. They're beginning to think back on what could have been. See, Jesus, in their minds at this point, was defeated through a political punishment. To be hung on a Roman cross was the most despicable way you could die in that moment. And it was a graphic reminder of who was in control. Rome won. Rome, the empire. These guys were the tough guys. These guys were who kind of kept everybody in control. And these are the ones that took out Jesus. And basically, in their minds, they thought that the Messiah that they were following had lost. And there was a sense... As they left town, you can feel it in the language here, that God had forgotten them. There's a sense that they believed that they were forgotten, that God was absent and distant. And ultimately now, they're walking away from the epicenter of it all. And I know probably there's many of us who are watching and involved in this today, and you've had these same feelings. At times, let's be honest, I think this is one of the things the church needs to be more, is honest and and real, that oftentimes God seems absent. Oftentimes he seems distant. I, I know there's times where it kind of feels at times, like even it feels like God has walked away. We have these feelings, and this is how these disciples felt. You know, one of the moments in the church calendar that actually helps us reflect on this type of feeling is the day Holy Saturday. So a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated Good Friday, the death of Jesus, and then we celebrated Resurrection Sunday, and we just obviously celebrated Jesus raising from the dead. But oftentimes, we forget to kind of lean into Holy Saturday. You know, in our culture, it's just true. Most Holy Saturdays are filled with family and food and Easter egg hunts. It's often a day where I'll go and get, you know, flowers and chocolate for Heather, getting ready for Resurrection Day and kind of anticipating the next day where we have fun with our family and celebrate Resurrection. But that Saturday, that first Holy Saturday would have been torturous. It would have been a day of mourning, a day of doubt, a day of pain and grief that Jesus was in the tomb. And I think, again, I'll just remind us that we need to think about it. We're on the other side of the story. We know what happens. We call Good Friday good because we understand the end of the story. That's why we call it good. The early disciples didn't know that Sunday was coming. And this particular Saturday, Holy Saturday in their story, was final, right? In their minds, the story was done. Their Messiah had been crucified. You know, Martin Luther, you're getting a Martin Luther quote. That doesn't happen often. But Martin Luther said that Holy Saturday was the day that God himself lay cold in the grave. Friday was death. Sunday was hope. But Saturday was the seemingly ignored middle day between when God occupied a drilly grave and a little garden outside Jerusalem. Saturday is about waiting, about uncertainty, about not knowing what will happen. It's about doubt. That moment you're unsure the sun will ever rise. And there's no doubt here, this is exactly what these disciples, as they leave from Jerusalem out, this is what they're feeling. See, they don't have the end of the story. And this day is painful. Again, their dreams are shattered. And now they're leaving the epicenter of it all to head out of town with broken hearts. You know, one of the questions we have to ask through this is why would these disciples, why are they headed towards Emmaus? Like, why leave, again, the epicenter of it all, where the hub of where the disciples are and everything's happening? And why do these two particular disciples leave towards Emmaus out of town? Well, to wrap our minds around this, I think we, for a second, maybe two or three minutes, have to do a little bit of a history lesson. I hope that's okay from wherever you're watching from. I do believe there'll be payoff in the end, just to connect the dots. If you think this is lame, you know what? It's a free world. You can just turn it off if you want. But I think to understand why they're going where they are, to understand that we have to kind of dig a little deeper. So here we go. You probably know a guy named Alexander the Great from school. You probably learned about him as the great Greek leader. And after his empire rose and then fell, 
the known world was actually split into four under four different generals. And if you know anything about the Greeks, one of the things they obviously wanted to do is expand, but not just in expand in land and wealth. One of the things they wanted, wanted to do in the known world is they wanted to spread Greek culture everywhere. Just think of Plato and Aristotle. They wanted to spread their thinking, their ideas, their rhetoric. They wanted to influence the world with that. Now it's interesting because then you have the Jewish people who believed that their culture was God-given. Just read the Old Testament. And it was just inevitable that this kind of conflict was going to happen between the two different groups. And so we see conflict at times between the empire and the Jewish people. About a couple hundred years before Jesus, there was this guy, a ruler, his name was Antichus Epiphanes. Antichus Epiphanes. And one of the things he tried to do is he tried to force the Jewish people to submit to Greek culture. And through a number of attempts, through his rulership, he tried to push Greek culture on the Jews. One of the things that he did is he ordered the high priest to defile the temple by sacrificing a pig in the Holy of Holies. And for some of you that hear this, you're just thinking like bacon to Jewish people in the Holy of Holies. This, well, let's be honest, you just know the Old Testament law, but this is not going to go well. Bacon in the Holy of Holies is not a good thing. I mean, it's detestable, un, an unthinkable act, really the, one of the most horrific things you could do uh, in the temple. And so again, for the Jewish people, this was unimaginable that something like this would happen. And so the story goes that at the last minute, a Jewish priest named Matthias rose up and killed the other priest before he could commit this blasphemous act. He stopped him, he killed him, and what happened is this started a full-blown rebellion during this time between the Jewish people and the empire. Matthias actually eventually was killed in battle during this whole revolt, and the following year, it's interesting, his son named Judas Maccabeus continued his resistance against the empire. Judas Maccabeus is a well-known figure in Jewish history. His nickname was The Hammer. And I'll just say, if you're going to have a nickname, just let it be The Hammer. That's like the, it sounds like WWE or something. Pretty amazing nickname. And Judas Maccabeus led a guerrilla-like war that resulted in a stunning military victory for the Jewish people. It was actually this war that he led in against the empire was the turning point that actually enabled Jewish independence. The story began to turn for the Jewish people as they were under the empire, and Judas Maccabeus was a huge part of this. Actually, his fame and his legend rose, and he was known as a heroic leader. He was known as a leader mighty in word and deed. Judas Maccabeus was. He restored the Israelites to their covenant land. He uh, destroyed the opposing forces. He set the captives free. Those who were in slavery, he set them free. And he cleansed and rededicated the temple, which was like huge for those people. Now think about it. If you were a young Jewish couple thinking about a revolution, your last memory of someone who actually succeeded was probably Judas the Hammer Maccabeus. Now think with me, in amongst all that history and what's going on, imagine what would have begun to stir in your heart and your mind and your imagination when you first hear the rumors about Jesus. So you're in exile, you have people over you, you're waiting for a Messiah to bring change and to bring the kingdom of God, and you begin to hear about this Jesus of Nazareth guy. Like Jesus' first message was repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus' first public sermon stated that he had come to set the captives free. Just think what's going on. I mean, I know as Canadians, we don't think or, or, or are anticipating much. We're not waiting for something to happen to really change the course of human history. But put yourself in their shoes when you hear that this one has come to set the captives free. Jesus taught with authority and had a reputation of being mighty in what? Word indeed. Jesus confronted the hypocrisy of the religious leaders and he cleansed the temple. Now, imagine what would have happened when he invited people to come and follow him. What are you going to do? In your mind as a Jew, you are just 
We need change. And this could be the one. I'm sure that the Jews hearing and watching Jesus were on the edge of their seats, hoping that, yes, this would finally be Israel's Messiah. But then, almost like it's in slow motion, everything begins to unravel. So much hope, so much joy, this could be the one, and everything turns. Jesus is betrayed by a friend. He's tried and convicted, and he doesn't fight back. One of his disciples pulls out a sword to defend him, and instead of Jesus encouraging that defense, he basically heals the opposition from that sword. Jesus is mocked. He's marched through the streets of Jerusalem and crucified on a hill overlooking the city, a city that these disciples probably would have thought he failed to save. I can't help but think what must have been going through the minds of these disciples as they headed to Emmaus. When they encounter a stranger, then who begins to draw out their thoughts and emotions? But why Emmaus? Why trade Jerusalem, the hub of it all, for the small town? You know, one of the questions I think we need to ask is, what are they searching for? Why would they be searching for hope in a place like Emmaus? Well, if you actually remember that great military battle that Judas Maccabeus one, remember the one we just talked about in the little history lesson, the one where he rededicates the temple, you know, the turning point in Jewish independence, that victory happened in the village of Emmaus. That's where it happened. And I don't know, maybe I'm overreaching, but it could be possible that these disciples were walking away from Jerusalem And we're walking to Emmaus because that was actually the last place they had seen God move powerfully. Maybe when they thought that Jesus had failed, that they were looking for another Maccabeus. Maybe in their minds, because they thought Jesus had now failed by being pinned to a Roman cross, that they would look for another figure that could fulfill their deepest longings. And maybe... And I would assume many of us are probably on our own road to Emmaus. I actually think there's many of us that are watching, including myself. I think it's just so easy to travel this particular kind of road. Maybe this road for you is something like, something that you think will satisfy you. Maybe it's the North American dream and money and wealth and status, which is right now being turned on its head. You know, one of the things that this moment and this pandemic is doing is exposing our idols. Maybe that road for you is a relationship or sex or power, or maybe it's a substance. Many of us are walking probably a particular road. And here's the good news with these stories, whether it's Thomas and Jesus showing up or here with these disciples. Jesus meets us where we are. Jesus meets us on the road. And he comes and he doesn't just give us theories or things to think about. Yes, he opened the scriptures with them. Yes, he began to show them the scriptures. But ultimately, Jesus shows us himself. In all our doubt, in all our skepticism, in all our hopelessness, which these disciples were feeling and experiencing, Jesus meets us where we are. And because of this, resurrection changes everything. A risen Messiah showing up to you and I changes everything. Michael Gorman, he put it like this. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus overcame the hostile power that held human captive. This decisive victory has become the very means by which the kingdom of God is established. Death is defeated. Evil and injustice are left hopelessly disarmed. All things are being made new because Christ is victorious. Jesus acts as the representative of the world and all its people and bears in his own being their destiny. In his death, he brings to end the old age dominated by sin, evil, satanic power, and death. In his resurrection, he inaugurated the age to come. These events create a new humanity, which participates in the death of sin, accomplished in his death, and the beginning of new creation, accomplished in his resurrection." Or as the great N.T. Wright would put it, he puts it like this. Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. How beautifully put. And yet, with all of this, everything we know about the resurrection, which is true. And by the way, 
just to let you know, New Testament authors, a lot of the New Testament authors point back to the resurrection and simply say that, listen, Jesus actually showed up to hundreds of people after his resurrection. It's just something we all have to grapple with and that's been passed on. But yet, despite all of this resurrection talk, which is good and meaningful and beautiful and such a central part of the story, I think we also need to be reminded that Jesus is thinking about us. That just like these disciples in their moment of doubt and walking away, Jesus is thinking about you and I. And he's meeting us along our road and he's simply saying, come and follow me. This is what Jesus is doing. Listen, I've been around this thing for a while. Since a little kid, I've been around the church and the Bible and the kingdom of God and I've heard lots and lots of stuff. And yet this is as true for me somebody who's a vet and been around this thing as it is for you if you've just turned this on today for the very first time and and are hearing this for the very first time. Jesus is simply coming to us on our road and saying, follow me, follow me. Now it's interesting, in the dialogue, back to the text, on the dialogue along the road, these people are hearing Jesus talk and then they're like, yo, you need to actually come and stay with us. Stay with us. Don't go any farther. It's getting late. Come and stay with us. And verse 30, it says, when he was at the table with them, they continued to talk. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. And then boom, their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from them. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So Jesus in his resurrected body, these disciples who were followers of him didn't really know and notice him. And then all of a sudden, and I don't think it's any accident, over bread and wine, he's continuing to talk about the scriptures and their eyes are opened and their hearts burn for him. It's no mistake. Just a few days earlier, Jesus said that when you get together as disciples, you eat and you drink, you take the bread and the wine in remembrance of me. And I think there's something where God's presence moves in and through that. And in in this situation, they eat bread together and their eyes are opened. Their hopeless situation and their hopeless feeling of being let down by this Jesus is now filled with hope. Jesus shows up shows himself, opens the scriptures, says, this is who I am, you can trust me, and their hearts burn. And I just think, man, there's, again, for myself, maybe for you today, there's some of us that are just, you're maybe walking the other, you're walking out of Jerusalem as a metaphor, and you're walking your own direction, and Jesus wants to bring that hope to your life and to my life, and to show you, this is like, this is legit, this is who I am, You can trust me. And I don't know about you. Again, I just look at my own story from a young kid to to now. The thing that is crazy about the Bible, about the church, about the kingdom of God, about everything that we involve our lives in when it comes to God is how this story is so just incredibly surprising. It is not the way most of us would draw it up. I often think about this whole story. It's not the way I would do it, right? God comes and is born amongst the animals instead of royalty. Instead of coming into Jerusalem, he comes on a colt. Instead of in power and with his entourage, he comes in one of the lowliest ways and lays his life down. He dies on a Roman cross. And again, Paul would pick up on this years later and say to the culture, to people in that culture, and even today, to die for a God to die on a Roman cross is a, it portrays powerlessness It it portrays defeat, and yet Paul says this is where the power is for those of us that follow Jesus. The power is in this thing that seems so foolish to the people around us. And then he goes into the grave, rises from the dead, people still doubt him, and then finally he shows up to people. This story, whether you like it or not, is so upside down. And I've just been thinking, you know, God surprises us. And he surprises us in a few different ways. God surprises us, one, by dying for our sin and brokenness in self-sacrificial love. For a God to die like this for his people was unthinkable, especially in the pantheon of the Roman gods. But the true creator of the universe comes in flesh and blood, dies for sin and brokenness out of sacrificial love. Two, God surprises us by defeating sin and death through resurrection. He defeats the powers, the hostile powers, the spiritual beings that have come against him. He defeats sin and death, all of that through resurrection. 
And God surprises us by meeting us in our doubt. Doubt is totally fine. All of us experience this. But he surprises us by meeting us in our doubts and giving our hopelessness hope. This is what Jesus does. Jesus comes and gives us hope. You know, one of the things that we lean into as the Christian community is that what happened to Jesus, Jesus is the prototype. What happened to him will happen to us. That eternal life starts now. We'll all die and go into the grave, but the promise for us is resurrection. And Jesus meets us on this road. And I just want to encourage us, as Jesus calls, whether you've been a part of this thing forever or not, calls us to follow him, that you would and I would give our lives to this. Whether you're a vet or you're here watching for the first time, that you would lean in to Jesus' open invitation for you to follow him. He's show, I just believe he's showing, even right now as we unpack the scriptures, he's showing himself to us. And we're going to take a minute here, and the guys are going to come back from their living rooms. They're just going to lead us in music. And I don't know how you want to do this this morning. You want to sing along, or you just want to reflect. Um, I hope this morning, through the next couple minutes as we sing this, what a miracle working God who shows up to us that we could accept this invitation. Let's sing together. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Yeah, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. And you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are. We make a Miracle work, promise keep that in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 
that is who you are. And that is who you are. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are waymaker. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 That is. That is who you are. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are way maker, miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Hey guys, we just wanted to say thanks again. Thanks so much for hitting play and joining us today wherever you are. And thanks for singing with us and reflecting on the Psalms and listening through the teaching and just opening up our lives to the kind of change that this could bring within us. We're just so thankful for you guys. Just one thing we want to leave with you. This week we start a brand new spiritual practice as a community. And because we're stuck in our homes, we're going to be doing the spiritual practice of scripture and study. There's two components with this. One, today we are starting a Bible reading plan through the Gospels as a church community. If you simply go to YouVersion and you check out the plan, The Gospels, by the Bible Project, you'll find a reading plan there. It's one chapter a day through the Gospels. We're going to do it for 90 days. Would you join me and my family as every day we read one chapter from the Gospels and journey through that? And listen, a lot of us are home and with our families more than we've ever been. Why don't you utilize time just to read a little bit each day? We're going to do that as part of shaping us around scripture and study. And then two, if some of you guys that are keeners, and we've had a bunch of people sign up for this, if you're a keener and you want to learn more about the Old Testament, we are offering a course starting this Wednesday evening for eight weeks called Introduction to the Hebrew Bible. And we are going to engage in some great material that teaches us how to read the Old Testament scripture and just how to, how to use it. How do we as a community, read and wrestle through it and approach it. It's led by and taught by a guy named Tim Mackey, Dr. Tim Mackey, he's amazing. And uh, it's gonna be a great time. So if you wanna sign up for that, just go to mypraxis.church slash spiritual practice, join in and we'll have a great time. Other than that, brothers and sisters, may you go in the grace and peace of Jesus. We love you and are thinking about you and praying for you. Go in peace. We'll see you next week.